The most obvious metric of code quality is correctness, i.e. does the code actually do what it's supposed to do? Any deviation from that we call a bug. Closely related to correctness is the quality of robustness. Robustness of code refers to the code's ability to function under unusual and adverse conditions and in the event of failures to fail gracefully. So, for example, robustness is a highly prized quality in, say, database programs. When a database program finds itself under heavy load because, say, there are many requests, or, say, the database is running on a system where other programs have eaten up all the memory, well, in such cases, a robust database would not necessarily be able to continue to function, or at least to continue functioning uh, with high performance, but at the very least, it shouldn't lose data. If the system on which the database gets borked and the whole system freezes, again, the database ideally shouldn't lose any data. Security, arguably, is also related to correctness, because when we have security holes in our program, we usually consider that a kind of bug. And in fact, it's often that a failure of simple correctness can be exploited by an attacker. So these three metrics, correctness, robustness, and security, tend to be highly complementary. Correct code tends to be robust code, which tends to be secure code. Another set of three highly complementary metrics are maintainability, readability, and understandability. Maintainability refers to the ease with which developers can work with the existing code, how easily can they add new features, and how easily can they fix existing bugs. Readable code is code which, at least on the line-by-line -line basis, is well written, especially from a stylistic standpoint. So readability is mostly about the microstructure of the code. Understandability, in contrast, is mostly about the macrostructure. It's at the broad level, how hard is it to read the code and understand what is going on? How hard is it for a programmer to come to the code base, read through it, and form a mental picture of what all the pieces do and how they relate to each other? So again, maintainability, readability, understandability, uh, these three are highly complementary. Code which tends to be readable tends to be considerably easier to understand, and code which is both readable and understandable is then generally much easier to maintain. And the more maintainable a program, the easier it is to fix bugs. So maintainability, readability, and understandability tend all to be quite complementary with correctness, robustness, and security. The last two metrics we'll discuss are efficiency and scalability, which again are quite related and generally complementary with each other. The efficiency of code refers to its minimization of the use of resources, resources of memory, resources of storage, resources of computation time. In other words, it's a metric of performance. Understand, though, that those are three different kinds of efficiency, and often you have to make trade-offs. Very often you're confronted with a choice between minimizing computation time and minimizing memory usage, or minimizing use of storage space, or for another, minimizing use of the network. The scalability of code is also a performance metric, but scalability refers to how code performs as the amount of data and work increases. For example, you might have a website that runs very efficiently when you have a small number of concurrent users, but if it doesn't scale well, as you get more and more concurrent users, the performance degrades precipitously. Likewise, when we evaluate algorithms for searching and sorting datasets, some algorithms are very efficient for smaller datasets, but then do very poorly as the datasets grow larger. So that's actually a case where we have to make a trade-off between efficiency and scalability. So efficiency and scalability are not always complementary. More broadly, these two metrics of performance efficiency and scalability very often are not complementary with their other metrics of quality, particularly with maintainability, readability, and understandability. The reason for this is that optimizations, by their nature, tend to be the unobvious way of doing something. If they weren't unobvious, they would have been the way we wrote the code in the first place. And usually, when we implement some code for the first time, we naturally start with one of the more obvious solutions. Clever optimizations, by definition, are the unobvious way of doing something. They make the code harder to read and understand. And in many cases, they often make the code longer, which in itself always makes code harder to read. The more code there is to read, the more someone has to understand, and the more bothersome it becomes. So it's actually the case that the most important thing new programmers need to learn about optimization is not to do it. It's very easy and very common for new programmers to get fixated on efficiency, but this tends to distract them from the more important metrics of writing clear and bug-free code. Performance is really not that important in most cases. For one thing, computers these days are really, really fast, and so the argument goes that programmer time is actually much more valuable 
than computer time. Computer time is cheap these days. On the other hand, there are some obvious domains of programming where performance really, really is important. Like, say, if you're writing a real-time 3D rendering engine. That obviously is a scenario where performance is almost the whole game. The more efficient the rendering engine, the better graphics we can have in real time. Just understand that most programming work that most programmers do, and this includes you as a new programmer especially, most of the work you do is really not performance sensitive. Now, if you've thought long and hard about your problem and have concluded that yes, performance here really matters, there are two very important guidelines to keep in mind. The first is the aphorism that premature optimization is the root of all evil. This is a very famous saying in programming. It's often attributed to Donald Knuth, but I'm not certain he actually said it. In any case, the second aphorism is that if you're not measuring, you're not optimizing. The common theme behind these two aphorisms is that programmers are very, very bad about predicting which parts of their code need optimization, and also really bad at predicting whether any given optimization will actually improve performance. So the best practice is to generally wait until you actually have a performance problem, and then identify precisely the parts of code which are causing the problem. And then once you optimize those sections of code, you need to test your optimizations. You need to test that you've actually improved anything. And this performance testing is usually called profiling. You profile the performance of your code. It's especially important to do profiling these days because of the nature of computers now, where not only does our code run in a system where all sorts of other things are going on that might affect how our program performs, high-performance computation these days tends to be heavily reliant upon the caches of the CPU. The cumulative effect is that it can be very hard to profile our code accurately. The performance you see when you run the same code twice can be highly variable. So when profiling your code, it's important to control the conditions in the system and also run the code many times. Don't just run through it once. A single run of the code could be highly misleading. So this is all we're going to say about performance. Again, the most important thing that most programmers need to understand is that performance, maybe 95-99% of the time, just isn't as important as we like to think it is. It's often a good idea when writing expressions to use unnecessary parentheses for clarity. That is, to include parentheses around the sub-expressions, which otherwise don't require parentheses. Like here, for example, we have a less than operation and a greater than operation connected by the AND operator. While the AND operator has a lower precedence in either less than or greater than, the intent is clearer visually if we throw parentheses around both operands to the AND operation. Not only does this have the benefit of being visually clearer, it just happens that many programmers often forget which operators have a higher precedence than others. With the extra parentheses here, they just don't have to think about that. When it comes to spacing in expressions, always place spaces on both sides of binary operators, like the plus sign. Also, put a space after each comma in a list of parameters or arguments, and never put a space after a symbolic unary operator, like the exclamation mark for not, nor should you ever put a space after an opening paren or before a closing paren. Like here you see in the call to foo on the top, the parens are padded with spaces. Don't do that. In general, the rule about spaces is where convention says to put a space, just put a single space rather than more than one. I can say quite confidently that the rules I just listed, those are pretty much the standard and most people follow those. Uh, a few people don't, um, but don't be one of those people. Another good practice with expressions is to split complicated expressions across multiple statements. So here, for example, on the bottom in red, you see one large expression, the value of which is being assigned to Kim. We can break this up, however, by first assigning one of its sub-expressions to a variable and then using that variable in its place. So here we're taking the call to Harry, first assigning that to a variable Mike, and then using Mike where we previously had that call to Harry. Probably the most debated point of style in all of programming is where to place the curly braces in languages which use curly braces like JavaScript, C, C++, and Java. The style I strongly favor is the one used most commonly in Java and JavaScript. And in this style, we place the opening curly brace at the end of what you could call the header of the statement, the line where we have the reserved word if, or else, or function, or whatever. As for the closing curly brace, it should line up with the indentation of the opening line. So here it's in the same column as the F in the reserved word function. As for indentation, 
you always indent the body of each pair of curly braces by one level. That part everyone seems to agree on. What they disagree about is what one level should be. Should it be six spaces, eight spaces, a tab character, or as I prefer, four spaces? In the Linux kernel code, for example, the prescribed style there is to use eight spaces per indent, with the rationale that it makes the indentation visually extremely clear, and also it has the virtue of discouraging too many levels of nesting. When every branch or loop requires eight spaces, that naturally discourages programmers from nesting too deep. I, however, find eight spaces visually excessive. Yes, it's very clear, but it looks a bit ridiculous in my eyes. Definitely you want to do more than two spaces, which some people prescribe, though I think that's pretty crazy. So I think four is actually the nice medium. As for the choice between tab characters and spaces, understand that there is no standard of how wide a single tab is. Depending upon your text editor, they could be displayed as the width of four spaces, six spaces, eight spaces. Uh, that's something that's up to your text editor. What I always prefer is to use a text editor that will automatically insert spaces instead of tabs when you hit the tab key. So in my text editor, when I hit the tab key, it inserts four spaces there rather than an actual tab character. The one variant of curly brace style which I find acceptable is one in which you place the curly brace immediately under the header, but only top level constructs like functions, methods, and classes, not for control flow like ifs and whiles. I think the idea behind the style is that some people like the top-level constructs like functions and methods to stand out more in code. In another variant style, though, the opening curly brace is placed in that position for control flow structures as well, so for ifs and whiles, which I dislike because it means your code takes up a lot more vertical space. It's already bad enough that we have to use a whole line for just an end curly brace, so why would you want to make it worse and use a whole line for every opening curly brace as well? Although the curly brace languages, Java, JavaScript, C, etc., all allow you to omit the curly braces of a control flow statement in which there's only one statement in its body, I think you should always include the curly braces. Similarly, when a body has just one statement, some people will sometimes put that on the same line as the header, but this is also something I think you should never do. My opinion is that uniformity is much more important than this minor savings on vertical space. Yes, it takes up more lines to express with the proper indentation, but if I just stick to the set style, I'll never have to think about it when I write my code or when I read my code. I won't waste any time sitting there and thinking, oh, maybe I should put this on the same line as the header because that'll make it take up less space. As much as possible, I believe you want to avoid those kinds of distractions. When it comes to formatting style, the most important thing after readability is whether it burdens the programmer with having to make choices. In the style I favor, the one formatting choice I leave myself is whether or not to take a really long function call, a long expression, and write it across multiple lines. Now, when this is done, one practice is to indent those successive lines such that they line up with the start of the first argument. I strongly recommend against trying to do this because it's just a waste of time getting your code to line up. Uh, in some editors, you may have an assistance that will uh, automatically indent the lines this way, and if that's the case, well, that's okay. But I don't really think it's worth the bother, especially if you have to do it manually, then it just becomes a hassle. So you should just stick to using one or two levels of indentation. Some people prefer two because that makes them visually distinct from a control structure like a while loop. My personal preference, however, is to split a function across multiple lines such that it deliberately resembles a control flow structure. So I just use one level of indentation and I put the end parenthesis lined up with the start of the statement. Now, aside from those two rules, when it comes to placing the arguments, you have quite a bit of leeway. For instance, you can see here at the bottom, we've actually placed two arguments on that last line, just because they're so short that it made sense to just place them there. In other cases, you may deem it clearest to put every single argument on its own line. In fact, for maximum clarity, you might bring down the first argument to its own line as well. In other cases, you might just decide to include multiple arguments on that top line. You don't just have, have one immediately after the opening parenthesis. So this is one area where there's quite a bit of leeway. Now, of course, the reason you would split a function call across multiple lines is that it got too long. So the question is, well, how long exactly is too long? Well, there's no hard and fast rule about this, but the general rule is that you don't want the entirety of your code to go past a certain column in your text. A commonly cited number is 80, 80 characters wide. So some people say that your code shouldn't extend past the 80th column in your text. That figure of 80, though, is probably outdated, 
because that number comes from the old days of the terminals. 80 characters was a standard width for terminals. So if you went past 80 characters on most people's screens, it would wrap around to the next line, and most people didn't like that. Today, though, of course, we have screens which are much wider and have higher resolution, so 80 characters, I think, is excessively constrained. However, I believe most people feel that you don't want to go too much beyond that, like maybe 120 characters is sort of like the upper limit of how wide you want your code to get. Personally, I don't really pay attention to the precise column width of the code I'm writing. Uh, what I do instead is I first of all avoid writing code with too many levels of indentation, uh, which mainly means within a function to only have control flow that goes, say, like three or four levels deep at most. So I would be careful, say, of putting oh, an if inside 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 an if. You only want to go so far with that, and if you find that your logic requires you to go deeper, what you do is you take those uh, inner levels of nesting, the inner control flow, and you split them off into some separate function and that way you avoid having to nest deeply. This not only prevents your lines from getting too long, as we discuss later, it actually leads to writing better functions. Uh, you don't want to have control flow in your functions, which is overly complicated. So you split the logic off into a separate function. That's my first strategy for avoiding lines which are too long. Beyond that, I simply look at individual lines and just eyeball how wide they are. Uh, how wide they are in terms of from where they start after the indentation, not counting the indentation. For me, it's just a matter of how complicated and verbose that one line looks, and if I don't like it, I split it up into multiple lines. In general, this usually keeps me under the 120 column mark. The one allowance I make, though, is sometimes when you write an end-of-line comment after a line, I don't really care how far off onto the right that stretches. If I have to horizontally scroll a few screen widths or two to read some of my end-of-line comments, that doesn't really bug me. And as I discuss later, sometimes with end-of-line comments, you're trying to comment an individual line, so it just always makes most sense to place it at the end of that line, even if that makes the line on that text very wide. I'm willing to live with that trade-off just to have the comment in the logical position. Now, while it generally is good practice to attempt to group the related statements within your functions by using blank lines to separate those groups, a common newbie mistake is to end up with functions where there's a blank line virtually every other line. It's quite easy, actually, to end up writing a function like this because you're trying to group the statements, but it's not unusual for every line in the function to feel like it belongs to its own group, like it's not related to the line that follows. So you end up with a space between every single line. If you end up doing this, you should go through and just remove the blank lines, because it turns out that this particular function just there's no really natural way to split it up into groups. It's all just one disparate statement after the other. But that's perfectly okay. In some functions, the statements can be naturally divided into groups, and in others, they can't. Some people take from this the lesson that you shouldn't try and include blank lines in your functions at all. I think that's a valid style, but it's probably overkill. I think it's still nice to attempt, at least, to split up the statements in a function with blank lines, just to give the code some breathing room. It's just nicer to read, usually, if there's a blank line, say, every four or five lines on average, just don't go overboard and put a blank line every other line. That just looks silly. Last thing concerning formatting is how should you organize things within your files and within other constructs like classes. My opinion is that you should simply order things by grouping like constructs together. So, for example, within a file of Python code, you'll have some number of classes, maybe some number of functions, and maybe some number of statements, some actual code to execute within the module. Well, the functions should be grouped together, the classes grouped together, and those statements grouped together. Whether you put the classes or functions first generally doesn't really matter. I believe standard practice in Python is to put the functions first, though I'm not clear on that. Though the statements, obviously, you would put at the end, because the statements may use those functions and classes. And for that to work in Python, the functions and classes have to come first. Similarly, within a construct like a class, you should group the members by basic type. So say, a class in Java, you would put all the fields first and all the methods afterwards. Maybe you would refine things a bit further and put all the public fields before the private fields and all the public methods before the private methods, or vice versa. The important thing is to have a convention and just stick with it. Now, what you should not do is, amongst your functions or amongst your classes, attempt to order them in a way that's either alphabetical or related by purpose. So say, don't place two functions next to each other just because they have to do with uh, string handling, or they're both math functions, or because maybe one invokes the other, or they're mutually recursive, or anything like that. The problem with trying to group things like this 
is that while in some cases the grouping by purpose may be fairly clear, in other cases it's a very iffy judgment call. It's a very subjective sort of thing. And just like we just discussed with these statements within a function, it's sometimes hard to group them naturally. Sometimes each one seems to just be standalone. You very often have the same situation with functions, where there's just no obvious way of grouping them. And so the problem is, if there's no obvious way of grouping the functions, then first off, the way of grouping that seems most natural to you is not going to seem natural to someone else. They're going to maybe have something else in mind. And you may not even consistently agree with yourself. So you write the code one week, and you group them this way, and then you come back to the code a week later, and you have no idea why you group the functions that way, why things are where they are. So the basic problem is that it's a fool's game. Moreover, in the cases where there is a very clear grouping, the better solution there is to group things properly into maybe a separate class or into a separate file. Moving things into separate files or separate classes can be bothersome, but that work, unlike just merely moving some functions around within a file, that work will actually really gain you something in terms of organization. If you try and organize things by just rearranging them within a file, you're mostly just going to disorient yourself in your code. This is actually one of the most bothersome constant aspects in writing code, is that you very often want to quickly navigate between various functions. And if they're in the same file, that means scrolling up and down constantly and scanning until you see the function you're looking for, or the class you're looking for, or whatever. This scanning process typically heavily relies on your spatial memory of where things are in relation to other things. If you're moving things around, you're just screwing with your spatial memory. So, beyond grouping things by like construct, you're mostly wasting your time if you try and logically reorder things in your code. For the most part, you should just let things lie where you happen to write them the first time, unless you're actually reorganizing things in terms of classes or splitting things into separate files. That, in contrast, can actually be helpful, especially in the long term. Now, I'll emphasize again that in practice, simply navigating up and down your code in a single file gets really bothersome while you're trying to write code. We have basically two ways of mitigating this problem. The first is that some IDEs will include a sidebar that is a list of all the elements within your file of code. And you just click on that element, like say the name of the function, and the IDE will move your cursor and scroll you to that element, to that function or whatever. The other way of addressing the problem is simply trying to keep your files from getting too large. The more lines your file has, the more bothersome it becomes to navigate up and down. In my experience, I can start to get lost within a file once it grows past about 500 lines in length. So I try to ideally keep my files down to about 500 lines. In practice though, my files probably average uh, quite a bit higher than that, maybe 750 or something. It does generally depend upon the language you're working in. In Java, for example, there's no way you can split a class across multiple files, and so if you have a large class, you basically just have to live with having a large file. Though so when you write Java code, you almost always are using an IDE like Eclipse or NetBeans. So you can always navigate using the list of elements in the sidebar. You generally don't have that navigation, though, when you're working in a dynamic language like JavaScript or Python. IDEs for JavaScript and Python do exist, but they generally don't work as well as with static languages like Java. So they're not as commonly used. Aside from the fairly straightforward question of how to format your code, Perhaps the most important point of style in your code is how you name things. How you name your variables, your functions, your classes, etc. First, it's important that you follow some very basic conventions that are very well established. In the large majority of languages these days, the convention is to start variable and function or method names with a lowercase letter. The point of disagreement, though, is when your variable contains multiple words, whether to connect those words with underscores or to use what's called camel case, which is the style preferred in languages like Java and JavaScript. Camel case is so called because the individual words of the names are capitalized and so appear like humps, like on a camel. Again, whether you should use underscores or camel case depends on what language you're using. If you're using C or C++, there the general convention is to use underscores. In some languages, though, like Python, there's some inconsistency there. There really isn't one standard that's one out. So you'll see a mix of both in Python. Most other languages these days, though, have a strong preference for one or the other. Another quite strong convention is to capitalize type names, such as the name of a class in Java or, say, Python. Again, this is not totally universal. For example, C predates the establishment of this convention, so I think in most C code you'll still see that these type names aren't necessarily uppercase. As for whether these type names use underscores to separate their words or whether they use camel case, that also depends on the language. In Java and Python, though, you almost always see camel case. 
Lastly, an almost universal convention for names is that variables to which we assign a constant value, a value which never ever changes, those we write in all caps and we separate the words with underscores, even in languages that otherwise use camel case, like Java. So, for example, here, our variable representing the value of pi, well, the value of pi never ever changes. It's never going to be anything other than 3.14159265. The only variance there is how many significant digits we're going to use. Uh, likewise, with how many pounds in a kilogram. For such variables, we want to make very clear that they shouldn't have their value modified. And while many languages will allow some construct to declare that variable unmodifiable, we still have this strong convention that constants should clearly stand out in code. The only judgment call part here is that sometimes you have a so-called constant, a value which, for the sake of your program, is not going to change, but it may be a value which you made up for the sake of your program. Like, for example, if you have some hard-coded value in your code, like, say, the display width of your program in pixels. Like, let's say your program displays as a thousand pixels wide, and always a thousand pixels wide. Well, you wouldn't want to have this magic number 1000 showing up constantly in your code everywhere. Uh, so you want to represent that with a variable, but the way you've designed your program, the value of that variable isn't supposed to change. So you'd have a variable in all caps, something like screen underscore width. What makes this an iffy case is that unlike, say, pi, which is a universal constant, something that absolutely never changes, well, the width of your program display in pixels is something that may be fixed today, but you may change your mind later, and you may want it to be a variable quantity. Like maybe there's a user preference that can change it from 1,000 pixels to 800 or whatever. So it's actually quite common that some things we may want to hold as constant today, uh, later on we're going to change our program and it won't be constant anymore. When I encounter this scenario, when I'm creating a variable which I think today I will hold constant but I'm not sure, I'll just go ahead and treat it as a constant, write it in all caps, but later if that changes, if it's no longer a constant, I simply change the name so that it's no longer in all caps. This way I don't have to waste too much time agonizing over some variable, whether it's truly going to be constant forever or not. So these are the more superficial rules for variable names, but what about the much trickier problem of coming up with properly descriptive names? The most general guideline is that the names of variables and type names, classes and so forth, those should be noun phrases, whereas the names of functions and methods, those generally should be verb phrases. After all, a variable or a type represents a thing, whereas a function or a method represents an action. The major exception to this rule, though, is that very commonly we have functions and methods whose primary purpose is to return some value. In such cases, it may make sense to name the function after what it returns. For example, if you have a function that calculates the area of a circle, it makes perfect sense to call that function area of a circle rather than something like calculate area of a circle or calc area of a circle or something like that. When you give a function or method a noun phrase name, it's just understood that that's what the function returns. Another key guideline in naming is to let the containing context of the thing you are naming to convey as much of the meaning as possible. And by context here, we mean the containing construct. So say, when naming variables in a function, the context is the function. When naming functions, the context is the module in which it is placed. When naming methods of a class, the context is the class. But now, what does it mean to rely upon this context? Well, for example, in a class called cat, presumably it represents a cat. If you have a method, say, eat, you definitely shouldn't call that method cat eat, you should just call it eat. Calling it cat eat would just be redundant because it's in the cat class, and anyone reading your code should be able to easily infer that, oh, this is about cats. So in your naming, when you rely upon context, that prevents you from introducing redundancies such as that. But also, relying upon context is what allows us from having to give everything excessively long names. For reasons I will discuss very shortly, I believe it's actually a fool's game to even attempt to fully convey what a variable or a function or a class does just by its name. That's just not realistic without giving everything names which are hundreds of characters long, which is not something you want to do for obvious reasons. However, it's important to note that at different places in code, we have more context than in other places. At the so-called bottom level of your code, that is within the functions and methods of your code, the local variables you create and name have the context of not only that local function or method, but also the module and possibly the class which contains that function or method. Whatever the language, our code is always organized in some way into a hierarchy of namespaces. The names in your code are effectively organized into a tree. The names at the roots, the names at the top of the hierarchy, 
have no context on which to rely, so they have to be more specific. Those are going to be generally your longer names, your more descriptive names, whereas down the hierarchy, those names have the context of the names up the hierarchy, so they needn't individually be as descriptive. So in general, the names at the top levels of your code are going to be longer than those at the bottom level, the local variables. And understand that generally you shouldn't be concerned too much about names that seem kind of long, especially function names and class names. If you find there's some name that you have to use over and over in your code and it's cluttering up your code making it more verbose, the better solution there is not to give the original thing a shorter name, but just to give it an alias. Another important guideline is to omit articles and prepositions. Basically, the small words of English. A, an, the, of, to, etc. So instead of, say, naming a variable the height of the door, you would just name it door height. I also recommend avoiding inventing any abbreviation. Widely established abbreviations, like, say, HR for hour, that's acceptable. What you should generally not do, especially, is try and shorten your names by taking out, say, a bunch of vowels or something along those lines. Now, this was something that programmers constantly did in the past, but it's an older style of programming. By now, most programmers have learned that such abbreviations just aren't worth it. To give you my favorite example, the Unix system call create is spelt without an E at the end. That's just stupid. It's actively hostile for anyone reading the code who isn't already very intimately familiar with that name. That's the problem with these abbreviations. Or for another example, the Unix system call FCNTL. That's an abbreviation for file control. 30 years ago, someone didn't want to bother writing out file control, and now we're stuck with this almost arbitrary name that's extremely hostile to anyone who hasn't been programming Unix for 30 years. Just in general, the tiny efficiencies of such abbreviations are rarely really worth it. On the other hand, it's quite typical within a code base to coin various terms, and certain terms will naturally end up in many names throughout your code. If these terms are more than several characters long, it really is kind of bothersome to see them strewn about all over the place. Like, for example, if you're writing some networking stack, and so you refer constantly to packets, it is kind of obnoxious to have to see the full word packet in all these various names. So in such cases, I make an allowance. If it's a term being used in many various different names throughout your code, then I think it's acceptable to invent your own abbreviation. What I hope, though, that you then do is document your abbreviations. You should actually keep a central list in your documentation of these are all the non-standard abbreviations I've invented and used in my code. This level of formality is a bit bothersome, true, but it does keep you disciplined about using your abbreviations sensibly and using them consistently. What you absolutely don't want in your code is to, say, abbreviate the word packet in various different ways. That's really obnoxious. So vowel eliding abbreviations were really common in the past, and they still kind of hang around in some newer code because it's just this hangover from an earlier area of programming. Another old similar tradition, which you should get away from, is the use of a type prefix naming convention, like what's known as Hungarian notation. Hungarian notation is so called because it's named after a Hungarian guy, Charles Simonyi, who was a programmer and executive at Microsoft. He introduced at Microsoft a naming convention in which you would prefix every variable with a letter or two signifying the type of that variable. So, for example, an int variable in C or C++ code would start with a lowercase i. The end effect is that all of your names end up looking a bit gobbledygook, and so the programmers jokingly called it Hungarian notation. Now, there are many arguments against Hungarian notation and similar prefix systems. I'll just keep it simple and say that, well, it makes code look ugly. Really ugly. The longer argument against Hungarian notation is that its supposed advantages really aren't advantages. Or, at least if they ever were advantages, they aren't advantages anymore with the modern tools and languages we have. My last guideline for naming, and this is my favorite, it's one that many people overlook, is that you should simply, as much as you can get away with, avoid naming things. Or, to put it more accurately, in situations where you're having trouble coming up with a good name, if it's possible to avoid giving the thing a name at all, you should take that opportunity. Now, how do you avoid giving something a name? Well, you can't do that in all situations, of course. But, say, in JavaScript, if you're creating a function to pass as argument to another function, if the function is only used in that one place, if you don't need to refer to it elsewhere, you don't have to give it a name. In JavaScript, you can just create it as a function expression with no name, and you can pass it directly as an argument. 
Similarly, if you have an expression where the return value of that expression is used only once in your function, you don't have to first assign it to a variable. You can just use that expression directly. This spares you from having to come up with a good name to describe that return value. And this is the important part which many people fail to understand. Yes, it is best when you can give things meaningful descriptive names that easily convey to anyone reading your code what they do. That's almost always better than using something as an anonymous one-off because you're adding descriptive information into your code. You're using names effectively as documentation. On the other hand, what many people fail to appreciate is that when you can't come up with a good name, something having no name is better than having a bad name. A bad name, at best, is just noise. It's clutter. But at worst, a bad name can easily be misleading. The broader point here about avoiding naming things is that naming things is simply very hard. This is especially the case in programming because a lot of what we do in code is very abstract. Very often we're not modeling real-world things that have names that are already established. Moreover, programming is inevitably about the details of things, and for the most part those details have to be given names, that's just the way code works. And just consider how naming details in the real world is problematic. Consider here this diagram of all the parts of a stapler. At some point in the development of the stapler, someone in stapler design and manufacturing had to coin a name for all of these things, and those names probably took a while to be popularized across the staple manufacturing industry. And while the name in some of these cases is fairly obvious, like spring or pin, in other cases there are probably dozens of different names for any one of these components that would make just as much sense as the name that was chosen. Even once you look at these named parts, like say the carriage here, that carriage is not just a generic carriage, it's a specific carriage. It has a specific shape specific to staplers, and probably specific to this particular stapler. It has angles, curves, indentations, grooves, all those things which, if we model in code, we would have to come up with names for, because that's the only way we can deal with anything in code. I, for one, would not like to have to sit and come up with a good, meaningful, non-arbitrary name for the round fiddly bit at the end of a piece of metal. Yet, this is not very far from what we end up having to do a lot, when we write code. It's not surprising then that many programmers take the easy way out and don't give things good names. They often lazily give their variables and functions nearly or even totally arbitrary names. You should try very hard not to be one of those programmers, but understand that there's often only so much we can do with naming. You're not going to come up with the perfect name for everything. For many things, there just isn't a name which will fully convey what that thing is, what it does to anyone reading your code. Sometimes that's just not an option. So while you shouldn't be lazy about naming, don't sit and waste too much time trying to come up with perfect names. That's another fool's game. Last thing concerning names is you should understand when it is acceptable to use single letter names or very short abbreviated names. So for example, there's a very strong convention that you name the counter of a loop I. That's just the generic counter name for a loop. And then within that loop, if you have another loop with a counter, you would name that j, and if you have another loop within that, you would name its counter k. Now, if you had a fourth loop nested inside the third loop, I suppose you would give it a counter named l, though generally you should avoid that deep level of nesting. When you've already gotten down to three levels of nested loops, you're already pushing things in terms of the complexity of your logic. Another very well-established convention is that when it comes to dimensional coordinates, it makes perfect sense just to use the names x, y, and z, because those are extremely well-established. Similarly, in various mathematic operations, there's an established convention whereby the inputs to the operation are simply named A, B, C, D. Another established convention is to use N for a count of something, like most commonly for the number of things in a list or array. And because string handling is such a common task, it's very common to just use a generic S, or something like STR, to signify a variable holding a string. Though generally in this case, in the context, it should be clear that there's really only one string you're dealing with. Otherwise, it would be ambiguous of which string you're referring to. What you shouldn't do is just call a second string in your function s2 and a third string s3. You shouldn't go down that route. When you start having multiple strings between which you need to make distinctions, you should then give them both proper names. This principle actually applies well with local variables storing any other non-numbered type. Like, for example, if I have a class turtle in my code, and I deal with a single turtle object within a function, I think it's very often acceptable to name that variable simply t, or maybe turtle, just give it the same name as the class, just starting with a lowercase letter. As long as it is fairly evident from context of why we are using a turtle here, we don't really have to give it a descriptive name. 
unless of course the function requires us to deal with two turtles. In that case, don't just call the second turtle t2 or something like that. You should start giving both of the turtle variables proper names, because now you have an important distinction you need to convey. Again, context is just an essential consideration in naming. Lastly, when I follow this practice of giving generic names to local variables by simply giving them the same name as the type, if the type name is very long and I wish to abbreviate it, I do so like such. I use the starting letter from each of the component words. I find that this is a much better way of abbreviating than cutting off the ends of words or alighting over vowels. Now let's look at comments, starting with which kind of comments are valid and which are invalid. In my reckoning, there are basically five different kinds of valid comments, the first of which are class, function, and module annotations. For every class, function, or method, or module in your code, you should virtually always include a description of the use of that class, or that method, or that function, or that module. The best way to think of it is that you wrote this function, or this class, or this module as part of some library, some piece of code which is going to be used by other people for their purposes. And what you want to document in their annotations is how should another programmer use what you created. What you should generally not include is a description of how these things work internally. What you're documenting is the functionality from an external perspective, not an internal perspective. So say when you document a function, you document the purposes of the parameters, because I, as someone invoking your function, need to know what should I pass into your function. And then you also document what return value I get and what significance that has. And you also document any side effects of invoking the function, like say if it prints something on the screen or saves something to disk. Again, what you do not document generally is how the function does these things. The real explanation of how the code does what it does is generally supposed to be in the code itself, and if you've written that code well, if someone really wants to know how your code does what it does, they should be able to just read your code. The second kind of comment is an annotation of a variable or field. These kinds of annotations you use much more rarely. In the case of fields of a class which are publicly accessible outside the class, in those cases your annotation is documenting how the field is used externally, just like when you document, say, a function or a class. You're documenting to the external world, how do I use this thing? In other cases, though, when you document private fields or you document local variables of a function, the purpose there is not really to document for an external audience, but to document to someone trying to understand the code. They're trying to understand what is the function of this variable. And as we've discussed, in the vast majority of cases, the name of the variable and the context in which it is found, those things together should convey well enough what a reader of the code needs to know. Occasionally, however, you'll have some important variable where it's just not really possible to come up with a succinct enough name for the variable and where the context doesn't help conveying its purpose all that much. In these cases, you might want to annotate a variable to give a fuller account of its purpose. For similar reasons, you might include annotations of the occasional line of code. Sometimes in code, for perfectly good reasons, you have that one line or two that does something that just might seem odd to someone reading the code. Maybe it just does something in an odd, unobvious way. In these sorts of cases, it's a good idea to annotate that surprise. Even if the rest of the code is perfectly well written, this is the sort of thing that's going to baffle someone reading the code. So this is a situation in which you write a comment explaining, here's how this code works and here's why it's written this way. Another kind of valid comment is what I call a section header. As discussed earlier, sometimes these statements within your function can be naturally grouped into different sections. In some of these cases, then, it might be helpful if you simply announce, here's the start of the code which does this part, and here's the start of the code which does this part. Even if these are the sort of things which someone could easily infer by reading the actual lines of code, these section headers can be helpful simply by making navigating easier, by making it easier to scan through the code, especially with longer functions. The last kind of valid comment is what I call a to-do stub. To-do, in all caps, is a traditional marker that we place in our code saying that, hey, here's something that we need to do later, here's something we need to fix later, here's something we need to add later. And I recommend you always write it together as one word, all in caps. That way, when you want to search through your code, trying to find, hey, where did I leave these to-do markers, uh, you can easily find them by searching for to-do in all caps. Of course, when you know there's something to fix, or there's some feature to add, it's always better to do that as soon as possible, rather than leave a marker and come back to it later, because you might just forget about it. But some things just take a long time, and maybe you're distracted by other things at the moment, so in practice, we usually end up working on things in fits and starts. Arguably, though, a better way of keeping track of all these things that you need to do 
is to not place a to-do stub, but rather to file a ticket in your bug tracking system. A bug tracking system is some kind of program that keeps a database of bugs that need to be fixed and features which need to be added within a project. It's always good practice to use one of these bug tracking systems in any non-trivial project you undertake. As for invalid comments, the sorts of comments you shouldn't include in your code, first on the list are the comments which simply explain the code as if the reader of the code doesn't understand the language, or they don't understand, say, some API being used. A lot of newcomers to programming think that, well, because I'm struggling with the language or with this API I'm not familiar with, that means that others reading my code are going to struggle with it as well, but it's really not helpful to explain basic language features in the midst of your code. You're just adding clutter, really. Unless, perhaps, you are explaining or pointing out use of some very obscure feature of a language. If the language feature you're using really is truly obscure, well, that, in a sense, is a kind of surprising code, so it would make sense to add an annotation of that. Generally, though, you should expect the readers of your code to be competent in the language in which the code is written. Otherwise, what the hell are they doing reading your code? The other major kind of invalid comment is an annotation of a bad piece of code. If you write code which is really bad, the proper thing to do is not to document that, hey, this code is really bad, the proper thing to do is fix the code. If there's a better way of writing the code, write that instead. Don't just leave the bad code as is and throw in a warning sign. Now, if a somewhat ugly piece of code truly is necessary and can't really be improved, well, then that's a kind of surprising code, and you annotate that, and that would be a proper comment. Otherwise, if it's something that really can be fixed, you're just being lazy if you just toss on a comment. So, if I have to sum up the general principle of commenting, it is two parts. First, code ideally is self-documenting. That is, it is perfectly readable and understandable without any comments. That, at least, is the ideal. And the second part of the general principle is that you should not comment those things which the code itself conveys. So, you should not document those things which someone versed in the language can infer perfectly well just by reading the code itself. When it comes to formatting comments, my general rule is to align a comment with the line which it comments, but when it comes to comments written after a line of code, do not try and align those with each other. Yes, it might make your code look a little prettier, but it's really just a waste of time. So here, for example, we're documenting the function foo with a so-called doc string. A doc string, as in document string, is what we call the comment which annotates a function or a class or some other top-level element of code like that. And here it's written as a multi-line comment that is aligned with the start of the function itself. And note that generally, at least in the curly brace languages, convention is to put the doc string above the thing which is being documented. In a few other languages, like Python, the convention is to place the doc string immediately after the starting line of the function. And actually in that case in Python, the convention is to indent it with the body of code. In any case, the two end-of-line comments we have here, these are annotations of these individual lines, and notice that they are not aligned with each other. Some programmers anally insist on getting those things to line up, but really there is no standard amount of space to include between the end of a statement line and the start of a comment on that line. And of course, different lines of code can be different lengths, so the end-of-line comments you include don't naturally line up. Attempts to rectify this, however, I strongly feel is just a waste of time. If you waste your time aligning these comments, well, then you're going to go back and edit your line of code, and so suddenly the comments will be out of alignment, and you'll have to constantly readjust those to keep them in alignment. But it's something that just doesn't really matter, so this is another kind of fool's game, trying to get your end-of-line comments to align with each other. Comments in code are what we call internal documentation. They are internal to the code itself. The external documentation is any documentation outside the code. This documentation might take many forms. You might have a formal document in your project. You might maintain a wiki that all the developers on your project use. It might just be a mailing list used by all the developers to communicate, or it might just be scribblings on a whiteboard. However formal or informal your external documentation process is, what sort of things would you document? Well, there's the development process, structural things like who's responsible for what, who should you contact about these sorts of problems, where should you submit a bug report, that sort of thing. You might also document the build process, which is the whole process of taking your source code and converting it into a usable program. In some cases, that's fairly trivial. It's just a matter of uh, a simple compilation job. In other cases, it can be more complicated. So sometimes that requires documentation. 
You might also document the architecture, that is the broad structural design of how the program works. You could document the dependencies, that is, you list out all the external libraries you're using, things of that nature. And something I find very helpful, though not enough projects do this, you can document the terminology and abbreviations used in your code. Something as simple as that can make it a lot easier for someone to come to your code base and be able to understand what's going on. Perhaps one of the most important skills you need to develop as a programmer is the ability to identify what constitutes a good function, and in particular, how should you decompose your code into separate functions, especially when should you take a long function and split portions of it off into separate functions. Well, the three most important guidelines are that a good function does what the name says it does, and only that one thing, is generally shorter rather than longer, and it doesn't have too many parameters. In your whole code base, you generally want your functions to, on average, have somewhere like 1 to 3. That's the average, though. So you can have some functions where the number of parameters is like 6 or 7, though that's generally the high end. Once you get up beyond 6 and 7 parameters for a single function, that's generally unwieldy. If you find yourself with such a function that seems to require too many parameters, the solution there is either that your function isn't really doing just one thing, that you're bringing in all this input data because the function is taking on too much responsibility, or the problem is that the parameters are really things that should be bundled together in a single object, either in some collection object like a list or map, or in some declared type that should exist in your code, some class you should have created. It's either one of those things, or both. It could be that you need to split the function up into more than one function because it's taking on too much responsibility, and it could also be the case at the same time that some of those parameters need to get bundled together into a single object. Now, as for the length of your functions and methods, there's no definitive answer for how long they should be on average. Some people will tell you that an average length of 40 lines is the ideal, other people will tell you it's 10. Most people, though, myself included, will tell you it's somewhere around 20 to 30 lines. That's the ideal length for most functions. Now, notice I said average function and most functions. It's perfectly okay in your code to have a percentage of exceptions, some which are quite long, up to like 100 or even 200 lines in length, and other functions which are really, really short, as short as a single line or two. The most important criteria for appropriate length is, again, does the function really do the one thing that the name implies it does? If you find that you have snuck in extra functionality and responsibilities to a function, generally you want to take those chunks of work and split them off into their own functions. Or perhaps say you have a long function where there are sections which do f still fall under the banner of what the name of the function implies that function does, and yet you have this whole chunk that comprises a discernible subtask, something which is a step along the way to accomplishing that larger goal. Well, when you have a significant chunk of code like that within a function, it generally makes sense to split those chunks off into their own functions. For me, the rule of thumb is, if I were to take these 5, 10, 15 lines of code and split them off into their own function, do I know what I would call that function? And if there's an obvious name for that function, then the answer is a strong yes. So, usually a function which seems overly long, that's just a symptom of a deeper problem, where the function isn't really doing just one thing, or it contains code that accomplishes some subtask, which itself could be split off into a separate function. If you just keep a lookout for such cases, over time most of your code will decompose into functions which, on average, are reasonable length, something like 20 lines. On the other end of the spectrum, you generally shouldn't hesitate to create functions which might seem overly short such as just one or a few lines. Those actually can be very useful. I think most programmers would agree that you wouldn't want all of your functions to be two or three lines in length, because even though then all your functions individually would be easy to understand, the whole of your program would likely be harder to understand. To locate pieces of functionality in the code, you'd have to identify dozens of functions to find just one piece of functionality, rather than looking at just one or two functions. So I believe that's why most programmers prefer an average length of something more like 20. On the other hand, a very short function can be useful in a case where, say, you have some expression which you find is repeated throughout your code. Rather than having that same expression repeated many times, it's better to encapsulate it in a function, even if that function is really, really short, even just a single line that does one or two math operations. It may seem silly to have such a short function, but if that particular operation has been repeated in many places, the situation you don't want to be in is finding out that, oh wait, I need to change that operation everywhere it occurs, and so I'm going to have to go through the code and change it in every single place. 
If instead of using that expression repeatedly, you encapsulated that into a function and then just invoke that function wherever the expression was meant to occur, you would only have to change this code in one place where the function is defined. So you really shouldn't hesitate from creating a function just because you think it's too short. If it's an identifiable operation which you use repeatedly in code, make that a function. So if you follow these general guidelines, you should write some pretty decent functions. The best possible functions, though, the ideal functions, they conform to the stricter, more mathematical sense of a function, which is that they are idempotent. An idempotent function does precisely the very same thing every time it is called with the same arguments. It doesn't change its behavior based upon any external state. Moreover, these mathematically ideal functions not only are unaffected by the outside world except the input parameters passed to them, they also don't modify anything outside themselves. They don't produce any side effects, they only produce a return value. So, in other words, an ideal function doesn't read or write any immutable data which is outside of the function. If you watched the earlier video about programming languages, you may recognize that this is the ideal which the functional paradigm aims for. But this is just an ideal, and even in the functional paradigm, we never fully achieve this ideal. And this is simply because for programs to ever do anything useful, they have to interact with things outside themselves. They have to interact with state existing outside the program. And so we can't have a program consisting entirely of functions that deal only with data internal to themselves. What you should take to heart, however, is a general guideline to minimize shared mutable data. Shared here meaning data which is visible to different contexts, data which isn't just internal to one function, but rather seen between one or more functions. And also note that again, the concern really is with just mutable data, mutable state. Immutable data, immutable state, cannot be changed, and so it doesn't really matter if multiple contexts are using the same immutable data, because then what one context does with that data is never going to affect the use of that data by any other context. If we have something that's mutable, though, in one function, I might change a value, which then changes what happens when I invoke some other function. So the essential problem with shared mutable data is that it creates cross-dependencies. But one of the main purposes of decomposing our code into separate functions is that those functions ideally are standalone. They are units which can be understood in whole just by themselves. When our functions have side effects that may affect other functions, our functions are no longer isolated. They're no longer self-contained. So if shared mutable data is bad, how do we avoid creating it in our code? Well, the primary example of a shared piece of mutable data is a global variable. If you're lazy and use global variables where you really don't need them, you'll soon find yourself swamped in shared mutable state. Global variables, though, aren't the only place you can have shared mutable state. The fields of an object, for example, while not global to the entirety of the program, they do represent data which is shared between the methods of that class. And such shared state is problematic for all the same reasons, though, of course, in these cases, the variables are at least localized to the class. So whatever problems this shared state might cause, the potential for error is much more confined. However, at its worst, object-oriented programming not only fails to solve this problem of shared mutable state, it can actually enable it and merely disguise it to the programmer. A lot of programmers get it drilled into their head that the problem is merely global variables rather than just the general problem of shared mutable state, so they easily end up recklessly using fields as holders of shared mutable state when what they really should have done is minimize their use of shared mutable state entirely. This is quite understandable, though, because truly minimizing shared mutable state is often a quite difficult thing to do. Again, be clear, the goal is not to eliminate it entirely, because that's just not possible in most things we want to do in code. But each time you create more shared mutable state, you should consider very carefully whether it's truly necessary. Another very important consideration for keeping the complexity of your code under control is the structure of your dependencies. The general principle is that, ideally, dependencies should go in one direction. Or, to put it more accurately, the graph of the dependencies in your code should form what's called a directed acyclic graph, a DAG, a DAG. For example, this tree here is a directed acyclic graph, and understand that the arrows denote the direction of dependency, so here A depends upon B, and B in turn depends upon D and E. If we also had a dependency from E back to A, this would no longer be an acyclic graph, it would be cyclical, because the relationship between A, B, and E forms a cycle. 
Likewise, if we had a mutual dependency where B depended upon E and E depended back on B, well, that's also a cycle. Now, the ideal dependency structures are those which form a neat tree, like what you see here. But if we throw in a cross dependency, like here from B to C, well, now it's no longer a proper tree, but it is still a directed acyclic graph. Now, we need to explain two things. First, what exactly do we mean by a dependency? And second, what's so bad about cyclical dependencies? Well, a dependency is just a broad term for any time one piece of code relies upon some other. Usually we're talking about, say, functions which rely upon other functions, classes which rely upon other classes, or modules which rely upon other modules. So, for example, if in your code you bring in some library to use, well, your code depends upon that library, but the library does not in turn depend upon your code. The library is independent. You are referencing and invoking the code in the library, but the library is not doing the same with your code. Now, the general problem with dependencies is that the more dependencies a single component relies upon, the harder it is to understand and work with that component in isolation. Mutual dependencies are even worse in this regard, because then when two things depend upon each other, I can't do anything with one without consideration of the other. The ideal component has the independence of a library. It's something which is written almost no specific consideration of the code which is going to use it. It has a well-established public interface for how it should be used, but its internals are a black box known only to itself. So, the problem with cyclical dependencies is that they are mutual dependencies, and mutual dependencies can't live up to this black box ideal. Now, I should be very clear that eliminating all mutual dependencies from the entirety of your code is, in most cases, not totally feasible. Still, it's very important that you not be lazy and at least attempt to minimize your mutual dependencies, otherwise as your code gets larger and larger, it'll just get out of hand. It will get more and more complicated, and you'll start introducing bugs and, and have a harder time fixing your existing bugs, and a much harder time introducing new features. So, we've said everything we'll say here about what good code looks like, but what about the actual process of writing code? Especially when I sit down with a new project, where do I even start? Well, in software development, there's actually a whole field of opinion about the process of writing code called methodology. There are many competing methodologies out there, kind of like how there's tons of contradictory dieting advice. A lot of the methodologies out there are very formal, and they have in mind software development conducted in large groups, such as in a big company. As long as you're still just learning the program, I recommend you stay away from those kinds of methodologies, because they tend to be, at best, just not very helpful or even insightful for someone working on their own, which is, I assume at least, how you'll be doing most of your coding for quite a while. Rather than go into the details of any popular methodology, I'm just going to give you a few broad themes found in a number of popular methodologies. First, when you start on a project, you have two basic different approaches. You can try working out your design from the top down or from the bottom up. Working top down means that you try and figure out what all the components are and how they relate to each other. In other words, it's working out the design on a macro level, whereas in a bottom up approach, you don't presume to figure out the broad strokes ahead of time, you just start in on something that you think you need and you actually try and implement that. You actually start in on writing the code for one or a few components and you just see where that leads. Now, the reality is that there are problems with both of these approaches. When you're working top-down on any non-trivial problem, you're painting in the broad strokes without account for the details, because, of course, even the smartest human mind is limited, and we just can't think of all the details, we can't predict them all. If we could, we wouldn't have to talk about methodologies, we'd just sit down and write all the code. So, what can happen is that you will work out a top-down design, and then you'll go to actually write your code, and you'll realize that, oh wait, the way this is all structured doesn't make sense once I get down into the details. It may turn out that this component and this component just don't really fit well together, and it may turn out that there's whole things that you've missed that you've forgotten about, and so the whole macro structure may need to be rethought. Conversely, if you start with a bottom-up design, you're not even trying to anticipate a macro structure for your code. You're basically just letting the code accumulate as you write it, and so the macro structure that then emerges tends to be messy and complicated. The other danger is that if you just set in to write code without consideration of the whole of the project, 
very commonly you will end up having to reassess and realize that, oh, all this code I've written, it's not even what we really want anyway. Either it just doesn't fit properly and where the whole structure needs to go, or maybe it implements some feature that we don't even really need. So the practical reality is that we shouldn't use either a purely bottom-up approach or a top-down approach, but rather some mix of the two. But of course, thinking in terms of top-down versus bottom-up, those are directly contradictory. You can't do them at the same time. So really in practice, what you do is you go in a cycle. You spend a bit of time thinking in terms of top-down, then you go bottom-up, and you go back and forth. In other words, it's an iterative process of reassessment. And you do this constantly, not just at the start of your project, but throughout the whole thing. This is basically the dominant common theme of all methodologies out there today. In an earlier time, like back in the 60s and 70s, people had a notion that you would do everything top-down, that you should have a definitive plan where everything is thought out ahead of time, such that the actual process of writing the code is just fulfilling a design, like it's just filling in an outline. With a few decades of experience, most people realized that, hey, that just doesn't work. If we can't figure out what all the details of a complicated system should be all at once and hold that all in our head, then we can't successfully predict what an outline of all the details should look like. Another very effective strategy is what's often called exploratory development. The idea is that when we set out to do a project, when we sketch out our first top-down design, there are some aspects which we're more comfortable with than others. There are components which are very like things we've already done before, and things which we've never done at all. It's these unfamiliar areas especially which are sources of uncertainty. We have very great difficulty making even preliminary plans in these areas because we really don't know what we're dealing with. So say for example that you set out to write a game, yet in your prior experience you as an individual or perhaps those of the people you're also working with, maybe you've never created a game. Maybe you've never dealt with rendering two-dimensional graphics or three-dimensional graphics. Maybe you've never dealt with audio or basic AI routines. In such cases, then, a very effective thing to do is try and explore those areas in isolation. Like, say, maybe if you're comfortable with audio and 3D graphics, but you know nothing about AI, you should concoct some very basic proof-of-concept project, something that allows you to focus on AI itself, even if what you write will be totally scrapped and won't be integrated into the larger project. You're really just trying to familiarize yourself with this domain. And in other cases, maybe you're working with some library or some framework you've never worked with and you're pretty sure you want to use them in your project, but you're not really certain, because you don't know exactly how it works. You just don't have any experience in this area. So again, it can be very useful to concoct some small project where you can use this library or framework in isolation just to get yourself comfortable with it. This can be very worthwhile, even if the code you write is going to get tossed out. Lastly, the principle common to both of these themes is that, just like in writing English, good writing is actually a process of rewriting. So you shouldn't paralyze yourself with the expectation that the first thing you're going to write down is going to be perfect, or even perhaps simply functional. It's just very, very rare to set something down in text and get it right the first time, or even the second, third, or fourth time. The corollary of this is that if you expect to write well, you should constantly reassess what you have already written. If you don't rethink what you're doing as you do it on a regular basis, what tends to happen with your code is that it gets more and more complicated and messier and messier, and it becomes an albatross around your neck.